Hello friends, today we will be talking on the venous drainage of the lower limb. I am Dr. Daksha Dikshit, Professor of Anatomy, Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, Kelly Academy of Higher Education and Research, Belagavi. Let us first see a clinical case scenario. A 40 year old male came to a surgeon with chronic dull pain and several large dilated tortuous veins on the medial side of his left lower limb. The rest of the limb and the right limb was otherwise normal. The diagnosis given was of varicose veins. Let us just keep these symptoms in mind and proceed through the lecture. We will be discussing the venous drainage of lower limb under these following headings. Introduction, classification into superficial veins and deep veins, great saphenous vein, small saphenous vein, the perforators or the communicating veins and the applied anatomy. Introduction, the lower limb as we all know is a tubular structure with powerful muscles. These muscles are held together by a tough inelastic deep fascia which covers the limb like a stocking and that's what we call as the fascia lata. The veins of the lower limb are seen lying within this tubular structure or outside the fascia lata. Thus we can classify them as superficial veins which lie in the superficial fascia and the deep veins which accompany the arteries and lie deep to the fascia lata in between the muscles. The veins have valves and these valves allow the blood to flow from below upwards also from the superficial veins to the deep veins thus pushing the blood anti-gravity towards the heart. Venous plexuses occur within and between some of the lower limb muscles. Let us classify the veins of the lower limb. We can classify them as superficial veins. These are the veins which lie subcutaneously. They are present in the superficial fascia and these include the great saphenous vein and the small saphenous vein. The deep veins lie beneath the deep fascia and they accompany the major arteries. The deep veins below the knee are seen as venae comitants, a pair of venae comitants accompanying the arteries whereas above the knee joint they are a single named veins. For example, anterior tibial vein, posterior tibial vein, popliteal vein, femoral vein. Both sets of veins contain valves more of valves are seen in the deep veins as compared to the superficial veins and these valves allow unidirectional flow of blood. This picture shows us the veins of the lower limb. Starting from the inferior aspect, we see the small saphenous vein, the dorsal venous arch, the great saphenous vein. Continuing behind the knee joint is the popliteal vein which comes up as the femoral vein which enters into the abdomen and continues as the external iliac vein. This in turn is joined by the internal iliac continuing as common iliac and then the two common iliac veins fuse to form the inferior vena cava. The venous blood of the foot follows or flows from the deep veins in the sole to the superficial veins on the dorsum of the foot. In the leg and the thigh, the blood flows from the superficial to the deep veins as directed by the valves of the perforators or communicating veins. I repeat, the veins or the venous blood of the foot flows from deep veins of the sole to the superficial veins on the dorsum of the foot. In the leg and in the thigh, the blood flows from superficial to deep veins as directed by the valves of the 
perforators or communicating veins. Moving on to the great saphenous vein, we will study it as its commencement, course, structures accompanying the great saphenous vein, the valves, tributaries which we study as those near the ankle, in the leg, just below the knee and in the thigh and its termination. The great saphenous vein is the preaxial vein of the developing limb bud and it is the longest superficial vein in the body. It is formed by the union of the dorsal vein of the great toe and the medial end of the dorsal venous arch. This picture shows us the dorsal venous arch, the formation of the great saphenous vein by the dorsal vein of the great toe and the medial end of the dorsal venous arch. Once formed, this great saphenous vein passes upwards going anterior to the medial malleolus. It is about 2.5 cm anterior to the medial malleolus, ascends on the medial aspect of the leg, is seen to be about one finger's breadth posterior to the medial border of the tibia. Then it is seen to go posterior to the knee joint about a hand's breadth posterior to the medial border of the patella. It further ascends on the medial aspect of the thigh and reaches the saphenous opening. The saphenous opening is a round opening seen in the fascia lata and it lies about 2 cm below and lateral to the pubic tubercle. The great saphenous vein as it reaches the saphenous opening, it passes through the saphenous opening piercing the cribriform fascia and goes deeper. It finally drains into the femoral vein after piercing the femoral sheath. The great saphenous vein along its course has 10 to 12 valves more in the leg than in the thigh. These valves are located just inferior to the perforator veins. The structures accompanying the great saphenous vein. In the thigh, a few branches of the medial femoral cutaneous nerve accompany the vein. At the knee joint, the saphenous branch of the descending genicular artery accompanies the vein. In the leg and the foot, the saphenous nerve accompanies the great saphenous vein. The nerve is posterior to the great saphenous vein at the knee but lies usually in front of the vein at the ankle. Veiny section of the saphenous vein in the emergencies is usually done at the ankle. The saphenous nerve should not be included in the ligature around the vein. This is the point to be remembered. Going on to the tributaries of the great saphenous vein. Just below the knee, the posterior arch vein. It is seen as a series of venous arcades connecting the three medial ankle perforators and draining then into the great saphenous vein. Next is the anterior leg veins. These extend diagonally across the shin and drain into the great saphenous vein. Few veins from the calf which may communicate with the small saphenous vein. These are the tributaries below the knee. In the thigh, the anterolateral vein which commences from a venous plexus on the lower part of front of thigh and crosses the apex of the femoral triangle before it drains into the great saphenous vein. Posteromedial vein also known as the accessory saphenous vein. When present, this accessory saphenous vein becomes the main communication between the great and the small saphenous veins. Just before the great saphenous vein pierces the cribriform fascia, it receives three superficial veins. 
and these are superficial epigastric vein, superficial circumflex iliac vein and superficial external pudendal vein. The superficial epigastric vein and the superficial circumflex iliac vein drain the blood from the anterior abdominal wall below the umbilicus. The superficial external pudendal vein crosses the spermatic cord superficially and drains the blood from the scrotum and it also receives venous blood from the superficial dorsal vein of penis. Deep to the saphenous opening, just before the great saphenous vein terminates, it receives the deep external pudendal vein. This deep external pudendal vein passes posterior to the spermatic cord and drains the venous blood from the anterior part of the perineum. These are the various tributaries of the great saphenous vein. Moving on to see how the great saphenous vein terminates. The great saphenous vein as is seen here in the upper part of the thigh passes through the saphenous opening, pierces the cribriform fascia and goes deeper to enter or drain into the femoral vein. So it terminates in the femoral vein. It receives three superficial tributaries just before passing through the saphenous opening. Once it passes through the saphenous opening, it receives the deep external pudendal vein just before it terminates by opening into the femoral vein. That's the termination of the great saphenous vein. Moving on to the small saphenous vein, we will be discussing it under these headings. Commencement, course, structures accompanying the small saphenous vein, valves, tributaries and termination. The small saphenous vein is the post-axial vein of the developing limbud. It arises on the lateral side of the foot by union of the dorsal vein of the little toe and the lateral end of the dorsal venous arch of the foot as continuation of the lateral marginal vein. Here we see the dorsal venous arch and arising from the lateral side of this dorsal venous arch of the foot as continuation of the lateral marginal vein is how the small saphenous vein commences. It passes posterior to the lateral malleolus, runs along the lateral border of the tendocalcaneus or the calcaneal tendon or the Achilles tendon and it ascends on the posterior aspect of the leg. The same is depicted here, the small saphenous vein beginning from the lateral end of the dorsal venous arch moves to go posterior to the lateral malleolus, ascends on the posterior aspect of the leg, reaches the upper part of the leg. It is accompanied here by the sural nerve. It ascends between the two heads of gastrocnemius. And at the popliteal fossa, it pierces the deep fascia and goes deeper. Here it empties into the popliteal vein. Same is depicted here in the picture where we see the small saphenous vein arising up and piercing the deep fascia between the two heads of gastrocnemius, going deeper and draining into the popliteal vein. The posterior femoral cutaneous nerve accompanies the upper part of the small saphenous vein while passing from deep to superficial aspect. The small saphenous vein at times could have a variable termination. It may join the great saphenous vein in the upper third of the thigh either directly or through the accessory saphenous vein. It may bifurcate one joining the great saphenous vein and the other 
ending in the popliteal or the deep posterior veins of the thigh. Occasionally, it fails to reach the knee and ends in the great saphenous vein or in the deep veins of the leg. These are the variable terminations of the small saphenous vein. Moving on to the perforator veins. These are the communicating veins which connect the superficial and the deep set of veins. They show a predilection for the intermuscular septa. There are two types of perforating veins, indirect perforators and direct perforators. They penetrate the deep fascia close to their origin from the superficial veins. They do have valves which allow unidirectional flow of blood from the superficial veins to the deep veins. They penetrate the deep fascia at an oblique angle so that when the muscles contract, the pressure increases in the deep fascia and the perforators are compressed and this prevents the backflow of blood from the deep to the superficial veins. Musculovenous pump Pattern of venous blood flow from the superficial to the deep veins is enabled by the muscular contractions, thus propelling the blood towards the heart against the gravity. This picture shows us a section through the limb, starting from the skin going deeper. The first tissue which we see here is the skin. Deep to it lies the superficial fascia which shows the presence of the superficial vein. Deeper to this is the deep fascia. Deep to the deep fascia are the muscles. In between the group of muscles, we see the neurovascular bundle. We see the deep artery and around it we see the venae comitants which are nothing but the deep veins. And what we see here, a communicating vein which connects the superficial vein to the deep veins is the perforator vein or the communicating vein. Same thing is seen here where we see the superficial veins, the perforator veins which connect them to the deep seated veins. The important perforator veins. In the thigh, we have the adductor canal perforator or the hunterian perforator. Just below the knee, we have perforators. Lower leg or ankle perforators, which are the upper medial perforator, which lies at the junction of the middle and lower one third of the tibia. The middle medial perforator and the inferior medial perforator which lies below and behind the medial malleolus. The middle medial perforator lies midway between the upper medial perforator and the inferior medial perforator. At the lower leg, we also have a lateral or fibular perforator. Moving on to the deep veins. These veins lie beneath the deep fascia and accompany the major arteries. As is already been said that below the knee, these deep veins are seen as a pair of venae comitants accompanying the arteries. Whereas above the knee, these are single veins which are named like the popliteal vein and the femoral vein. The perforating veins at the ankle joint penetrate the deep fascia and continue as the anterior tibial vein in the anterior compartment of the leg. The medial plantar vein continues as the posterior tibial vein 
posterior to the medial malleolus. The lateral plantar vein continues as the fibular vein posterior to the lateral malleolus. All these three leg veins, that is the anterior tibial vein, the posterior tibial vein and the fibular vein form the leg flow into the popliteal vein. So, all these three veins of the leg will fuse to form the popliteal vein behind the knee, which further ascends up and continues as the femoral vein in the thigh. Venous valvular mechanism. Venous valves are cusps or flaps of endothelium with cup-like valvular sinuses that fill from above. When full, the cusps occlude the lumen of the vein, thus preventing reflux of blood distally, making the flow unidirectional. Valvular mechanism also breaks the column of blood into shorter segments, thus reducing the back pressure. Both these effects assist in musculovenous pump to overcome the force of gravity to return the blood to the heart. This is how the venous valvular mechanism acts. Moving on to the applied anatomy aspects. The principal cause of varicosities of the veins. What are varicosities? The superficial veins of the lower limb become dilated, tortuous and filled with venous blood. These are known as varicosities or varicose veins. What are the causes of these varicosities? It could be thrombosis of the deep veins which does not allow the blood to flow through and gives rise to backflow of blood or stagnation of blood in the superficial veins. Persistent elevation of intra-abdominal pressure due to abdominal tumours or multiple pregnancies or incompetency of the valves in the perforators or in the superficial veins or both. This is the commonest cause of varicosities. Incompetent valves in the perforator veins or in the superficial veins or both. Chronic venous disease. Sustained over distension of the superficial veins leads to development of short dilated venous segments and these are what give rise to or are called as varicosities. These varicose veins have thin walls. There is leakage of red blood cells into the adjacent soft tissues. Breakdown of hemosiderine giving rise to brown pigmentation. The persistent venous stasis produces edema or increased tissue fluid. Such tissues are prone to ulceration following minor trauma. It is commonly seen on the posteromedial aspect of the lower limb. This is what was seen in our case scenario as dilated tortuous veins seen on the posteromedial aspect of the lower limb. Acute venous disease seen in the posterior compartment of the leg due to sluggish blood flow in the deep veins. This sluggish blood flow in the deep veins over a period of time gives rise to formation of venous thrombi, thrombosis of the veins of lower limb. The deep vein thrombosis is characterized by swelling, warmth and redness or erythema. The venous stasis causes thrombus formation. Fragments of these thrombi 
may get dislodged from here. They are carried in the circulation and can give rise to life-threatening pulmonary embolism. Let us move on to the tests which help us to find out the cause for these varicosities. Trendelenburg's test done to test the competency of the cephenofemoral junction and tonicate test done to recognize the sites of the incompetent valves. How is the Trendelenburg's test performed? Person having varicosities of the lower limb is made to lie supine on the table and the legs or the affected leg is raised above the level of the heart so as to empty the entire blood from the superficial vein. Once the superficial veins are empty, a tight tonique is tied at the level of the upper thigh so that the saphenous vein is occluded but not the femoral vein. Once this tonique is tied, the patient is asked to stand up. The veins are observed for a period of 30 seconds. If there is no filling in the superficial veins in 30 seconds, it indicates that the perforator veins are competent. Once we see the filling of the superficial veins from below within these 30 seconds, it is indicative that the perforator veins are incompetent. If the veins do not show any filling for 30 seconds, then we release the tonique. On release of the tonique, if immediately the blood fills in from above into the superficial veins, that is indicative of incompetence of the cephenofemoral junction. We next move on to the Perth's test. The Perth's test is done to test the deep veins. In this case, the patient is asked to stand up. The veins would remain dilated, they are not emptied and a tonique is tied at the upper thigh. The person is asked to walk around. While the person is walking around, the muscular action will help in emptying the varicose veins. If the varicose veins are emptied while walking, that shows that the deep veins are competent. While if the varicose veins increase in varicosity and distend and bulge further on walking, it is indicative that the deep veins are at fault. So, the Perth test helps us to test the deep veins. Moving on to the operative treatment of varicose veins. Ligation and division of all main tributaries of the superficial veins and also of all the perforator veins involved. The superficial veins are most commonly removed or stripped after ascertaining the patency of the deep veins. Stripping operation. Herein, a flexible wire is introduced into the vein from the level of the medial malleolus to the groin where it is brought out of the superficial vein after disconnecting the latter from the cephenofemoral junction. The wire stripper is pulled proximally and the entire vein is avulsed by turning it inside out. Phlebitis Inflammation of the vein wall, a potential complication of great saphenous vein cut down due to the site of location of the vein. 
the great saphenous vein is often harvested for grafts used in peripheral and coronary arterial surgery due to the presence of valves the vein has to be reversed to replace an arterial obstruction thus summarizing what we have done we went first through the introduction of the veins of the lower limb we saw how they are classified into superficial veins deep veins and perforator and communicating veins we then moved on to study the great saphenous vein right from its commencement course tributaries accompanying structures termination valves we similarly studied the small saphenous vein as to how and from where it commences its course tributaries valves and termination we studied the perforator veins their location and their function and then we moved down to study the various applied anatomy aspects about the venous drainage of the lower limb we also understood how the case scenario was diagnosed as varicose veins we also went into the operative procedures for varicose veins and also the tests used to localize the defect in the varicosities of the lower limb thank you